so sensual. <laughs> That's how it starts. No, it's not. <laughs> what, Actually, what a way to begin it. Is, it. That is really what the movie is, is, really. I think Maggie and I are both going to agree at the end of the year that Oppenheimer is like the best thing that's come out this year. Yeah. But Saltburn is my favorite. It's pretty darn good. It's absolutely mm. my favorite. We saw it for the second time yesterday after we decided to do this episode. I just wanted more of it. I yeah. just wanted to bask in that world longer. So we saw it a second time. Also, Tristan is here. Yes, I'm getting to him. Okay, sorry. What's up? I'm getting to him. <laughs> we saw it once. We were thrilled. We saw it like three weeks ago. And I, it, it legitimately depressed me. The day after mm. that, I just like sat around feeling hopelessly underachieved because I don't I don't think I'll ever make anything this good. Sometimes great art rouses me to make something. This one, it was like I can just pack up you. and go home. Yeah. And then we got this text from Tristan a couple a couple weeks after we saw it. And he had a completely different angle and inroad into this story. So I I'm really excited to talk about this one because I think we all have a different angle on a work of art that we love. And for the three of us historically, that's always a good recipe. So I'll open it to you guys, but I just love this movie so much. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really excited to talk about this. Especially, I mean, I loved it when we saw it. And at first, I didn't think I was going to have an episode about it. Not because I didn't love it, but I don't know. It just felt... It just became Maggie's podcast. <laughs> I just she didn't here. think she was going to have an episode. <laughs> I'm just here I, to take I am over. not here for this camera and erasure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just meant I didn't know if I had enough to say about it because it was one of those things like like initially because it's we didn't, real real gay. Yeah, it's that's, not for the girls. <laughs> no, it is so for the girls. This movie is definitely for the girls. <laughs> um but no, I mean like like Oppenheimer was so large that I didn't think we could talk about it and then we just ended up talking about it in a really focused way um, and so I thought this might be kind of the same situation but after we talked to Tristan about it over text I was like oh yeah we could all have a good conversation about this together with these different I don't know but not even perspective just different like level like different interests mm-hmm. like different fields you know so it's that rare piece of art that enables you to come at it from so many different angles because there's just a lot here there's so many different ideas at play in in every single scene uh, that they put before us that it's almost overwhelming the number of different lenses through which you can view this. And that's why I I felt the need to text you guys about it because I'm like, okay, this is right up your alley. First of all, why hasn't there already been an episode (laughs) on this? That was literally the first thing that that I thought as I was watching it. I got about halfway through and went, holy shit. (laughs) <laughs> How have I not been spoiled on this already <laughs> by virtue of your episode? <laughs> so I'm glad that you didn't yet because there it, it's a, it's an incredibly rich thing I think we can we can dive into. Um do we want to do any sort of uh I I know that on your most recent episodes, you know, you're dealing with older art and or uh books. And so that usually means a bit of a plot recap. Do we do that here? Do we want to do that here? No. Nah. Maybe we can set the table for a second. That's what I was going to okay, say earlier. Yeah. Just This is a movie. It takes place in 2006 at Oxford. 2007. Th- 2007. Thank you. It's the class of 2006, isn't it? It is. I don't understand why it says that because it's 2000, It's the summer of 2007. And, and <laughs> Maggie the instantly director, getting off track. <laughs> I'm sorry. It just That's the summer that Deathly <laughs> Hallows <laughs> came out. And I have to make sure. Anyway. I don't like when the facts are wrong, okay? Anyway, it's about a student <laughs> at Oxford who makes, it's, it's his quest to make friends with the popular kid, and it spirals into a whole majestic mess at this castle that the rich kid's family has, and that he stays over there for the summer. What's the castle called, Cam? <laughs> Hogwarts. I think it's called Salt Burn? Um, we should also say, if you haven't seen this movie, stop and go watch it, because it... it you don't want to be spoiled. No, you have no. to go watch and, it. And it carries our highest recommendation. Yeah. Uh, it, like like Tristan said, and I think that's a, a lovely place to start, the depth that this has in every scene, the passion, the performance, the, the subtext, the angles, the hints of things. Like I know later we're going to get to a point where Tristan's going to talk about Greek mythology and I'm going to pull in some Shakespeare and, you know, my normal Faustus shit. And Maggie has all of her art history and her angles that she'll bring to it. But the fact that you can also just view it as a movie without bringing anything to it, and it is so enjoyable that it almost defies genre. You could argue that this movie is a straight drama. You could call it a classic tragedy in the style of the Greeks or Elizabethan theater like I like to play with. You could call it a comedy or a satire, a dark or a black comedy. You could call it a social thriller. You could sort of call it an ironic horror movie. It's so rich, and there's so much to play with. It actually, 
it reminded me a little bit of The Lighthouse. I know the three of us are bonded by Robert Iger's movies. Mm -hmm. The fact that this is the the second movie from a really hungry director, and they give themselves that creative limitation of basically making a square movie, I think it brings out the best in them. Hmm. I think you can see in almost every shot the composition and the focus to play with that strange aspect ratio. Mm-hmm. It just it, it felt like a wonderful bit of discipline by just restraining your ability to express a little bit. It creates a perfect little box for these yeah. hungry artists to work in. And, mm-hmm. and it's funny because despite all of the description that you just gave about it being into a box, it really defies one's attempts to put it in one because <laughs> it is very difficult to categorize, like you were saying, what this movie really is. Uh, be, <laughs> there's just so much to dig into, and and I I wanted to say I wanted to back up and like zoom out on the whole thing. I I don't think that this movie has a lot to say as far as a central message, right? This isn't one of those. This is not like a fable. It's not like here's the through line of the story. You get to see this develop as it goes on. There's not some grand scheme in terms of what the director is trying to tell you. There's not a central message. I think this movie is best digested and appreciated in not vignettes, but in small chunks in scene by scene uh, versus as a whole. Because I think if you view it as a whole, it's really easy to reduce it down into, oh, this kid is a liar and a sociopath and he gets what he wants in the end. That's so reductive. It's so reductive because you can't appreciate the movie unless you were there for every single scene because they might even feel disjointed if you try to view them all together as sort of one linear narrative, hmm. right? It's it's all different little explorations down certain rabbit holes of the human psyche, I think, that that's what really makes this movie shine. Yeah, I I completely agree. It it speaks to a depth of craft that I think is missing in most movies that lead with the message. Like, if we wanted to, we could do a podcast series breaking down every single scene of this movie (laughs) and still have a fruitful 45-minute conversation about all of them. And if you view it that way, like how we talk about books when we do a chapter at a time, when we do a retrospective at the end of, say, spending a year and a half on The Witcher, it seems like a mammoth undertaking to look back on a year and a half of all of these conversations and nuggets and ideas and details. It seems like you're trying to put far too big an umbrella over something to talk about in just a few minutes. I feel that way about this one movie, and I think that means for me that this is a work of true fiction because Mm -hmm. the singular interest here there is commentary there are ideas being played with but instead of it just being like it's a satire about class because there are class Mm. and uh, racial and economic disparities between some of the students at oxford like that's what i saw in the lead up to the movie coming about coming out that Mm. it was a satire about class and high society in england but i think i completely disagree, disagree with that i think saltburn has a singular interest in character and Mm. namely the depravity and ugly underbelly of characters Mm -hmm. i think it is emerald fennel doing as powerful a job writing as she is directing here chasing these characters and their desires to the ends of the earth any class commentary you can pull out of this is interesting but it almost feels incidental i think it's a garnish on top of a wonderfully complex meal yes i think if that's the only thing that you take away from this You've, you've missed a solid majority of what it really has to offer. And I like that you're talking about the character focus because I really want to give a shout out to Barry Keoghan here. Mm. I know that he plays one character named Oliver Quick, right? That is what he's billed as. Barry Keoghan plays at least six or seven different versions of this character throughout this film. Oh, yeah. And it all masquerades as the same person. <laughs> but I think the beauty of this is that he's such an like he's got such a unique look, but the character that he plays is so unassuming generally that it's just like, oh yeah, that's 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 Ollie or whatever. Mm-hmm. But he is a different person with each and every character that he interacts with. And that is most apparent whenever he gets alone time with oh. each of these other individual oh, yeah. characters because it's like it's like he turns it up to eleven and mm-hmm. he really pours on exactly what these other characters 
need to see from him in that moment so that he can get what he mm-hmm. wants from them. Yeah, I always love getting to dive deep into a sociopath. <laughs> but I especially liked it because like not only is like he doing this great performance of these like multiple different characters, but it also felt sort of like a bit of a not a commentary because we just said that that's kind of reductive of what this movie is doing but it made me think about actors and acting and how they have to become different people all the time and (laughs) i I don't know it was really fun in in that way i'm absolutely on that page because we have seen more movies this year than any year of our lives Mm -hmm. and i that means we've gotten to meet so many characters and seen so many interesting performances but more than any in any movie that i've seen this year or maybe ever this role is a role for an actor. Mm -hmm. It's not just a character or persona. This is a role in the same way actors talk about Hamlet being a role. Right. Because Mm -hmm. not only, like, yes, it's it's more interesting to be able to play a character who goes to so many different places, but the pressure of having to be able to be seven different versions of this character, Mm. it's so demanding. It is so delicate and soft-spoken because whenever he ramps up, it's so amazing when he gets these one-on-ones. I'm glad you brought that up, Tristan, because mm-hmm. he changes, he like morphs so slowly. He's changing his shape and his posture. He's doing this like Clark Kent to Superman thing, mm. but he's always becoming this like tarantula hiding in the corner of the room. Yes. I also liked that we were, even though we see this whole movie from his perspective, from Oliver's perspective, we are still tricked along with all of the other characters. At least I was. Because when you start this movie, you think that he's just like this awkward like nerd who's like trying to fit in. And you like feel bad for him. And you're like, oh, he's so out of place. Like, oh, I've been that socially awkward weirdo who like doesn't fit in. And that's so sad and relatable. And then as it goes on, you're like, oh, he's kind of weird. Oh, okay. I see what he's kind of doing. And then like towards the end, you're like, oh. And so you just feel totally not blindsided, but really like i don't know i was i was thrown for a loop and i was like how did i miss this even though i was following along with him this right. whole time right so it's it's a character focused piece and it's all about depth of character mm. but the the venue that we're playing in the like subject of discussion throughout the movie is sexuality mm-hmm. and i'm glad tristan you're here for this one because watching this i was so reminded of you and i having the discussion about van helsing mm-hmm. and us wanting to see more sexuality in discussion in representation in modern movies this one made up for it <laughs> and like <laughs> not only is is there sexuality here but it's it goes so i mean it's like mariana's trench depth of sexuality into the sexual subconscious because mm-hmm. it's not just about people having sex it's about the urges desires those wild like fleeting nonsensical feelings you have that just like explode out of you there's so much of that kind of scattered across this movie once you're dialed into the film's characters like i started to wonder What if they, and every single time, (laughs) every single time, not only did they do it, they went way further than I even imagined. Yeah. But it speaks to like an awareness of audience Mm -hmm. and an awareness of character. And that I just felt like every scene of this movie, Emerald Fennel is pushing herself further to make the characters go further, push further, push each other further. It's this, it's this what if feeling in every single scene. And I'm not going to spoil things, but just oblique references (laughs) The mm-hmm. blood, the bathtub, the graveyard, <laughs> yep. and the ending. Yeah, I know. Those are artists pushing. Right, and it goes back to what y'all were talking about earlier about the like this exploration of character and really diving into those different like levels and experiences of people. Like with the sexuality, it's diving into the the weird like intrusive thoughts a person has or like the weird like what if scenarios that play out in your head but you would never actually do or that would be fucking weird if I did that or if he did that or whatever <laughs> but they do it and you're and then they keep going yes. <laughs> and you're like Jesus Christ but it does it doesn't feel like this fantastical like that would never happen kind of thing it feels like it feels like a very human story just like taking it to the extreme but it's like exploring all the possibilities and it's really it feels true yeah it's grotesque it's embarrassing but it feels true Mm -hmm. like Saltburn, maybe above anything else is a master class in calling the audience's bluff Mm. it is the i mean i love oppenheimer i love all these other movies we've talked about this year this is the most daring blazing bold work of storytelling 
this year. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I've left with this like electric crackle you know, across <laughs> my skin both times that I've seen this movie. Mm-hmm. I just really think it's on that level. And you're right, Tristan, to to narrow it down to Barry Yogan for that because he is the beating heart of this movie. Absolutely. And, this this movie does not work without his performance. And, mm-hmm. and, and whenever I say his, I think I really do mean his. I don't just mean the character. Uh, the way he was able to shapeshift uh, into any given role that he had, uh, you know, with that specific character, or, or you know, across from another specific character, that that was so impressive. And I think I, I saw somewhere on Reddit, someone was like, "Yeah, this movie catapulted uh, Barry Keoghan into one of those actors where I will go see anything that he's in <laughs> ever." Totally. And I a hundred percent agree with that. I already thought that he was a pretty magnetic performer just any time that I've ever seen him, but being given the chance to, to really, you know, take the reins on this one, Mm -hmm. uh, was, was awesome to see. And, and I'm in that boat now. I would like to go, uh, I I will not miss another, another film from him. (laughs) Um, I wanted to explore some of the, the like themes a little bit here, uh, with, with you guys. I, I, we can, we can talk a lot, about the movie generally, but I think it's really rewarding to actually dig into some of what happens. Yeah. Right, so I, I so I'll use the, the the sexual point that Cam was just making to sort of spin off and, and and touch on one of the things that I really just thought of as we're talking about this right now. The sexuality is something that he uses as a tool. Barry's character uses as a tool throughout the entire film. Um, it's an extension of him changing his personality to get what he wants. Every character that he's able to work over, he has some sort of sexual encounter with Mm -hmm. and exerts some sort of control over. That is the sister, that is the cousin, that is (laughs) in some way the mother. Totally. Because he he, he, he develops some sort of infatuation with him in her. Right, mm-hmm. complimenting the way that she looks, and she ultimately, you know, super excited when she sees him again. Um, and then, you know, upon her death, the way he mounts her, it, it is oh. sexually charged too, yes. right? Yeah. So, you you get you get that sexuality as being core to his ability to manipulate. And the one person that he doesn't really get to fulfill that with, obviously, um, is is the the other male lead. Uh, in this in this movie, um, played by Jacob Elordi, Felix. Felix. Yes, Felix is his name. And <laughs> the, the 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 whole movie starts out as something that feels like I, I don't know if you've read this, but a separate piece. Um, oh, okay, I haven't. Have, you, read have it. you guys read that? No. Mm-mm. Okay. Well, a separate piece takes place in uh, like I think it's Exeter Academy. It's a U.S. school, boarding school in the Northeast for boys. Um, and and that whole book explores uh, what has largely become known as a, a, a gay relationship between the author of the book or, like, the main character of the book and the, the other male lead. And, and there's it's not overt. There's a lot of hinting about it, and, and, and there is that angst and anxiety Um especially given that it was, it was written decades ago, right? Mm-hmm. So it was not, it was a taboo subject. Mm. Um, but the character in that book, there's, there's this yearning back and forth that you don't ever really get to see come to fruition. But I thought that's what this was going to be. Mm-hmm. I thought this was going to be some sort of like cat and mouse game of Barry Keoghan trying to get with Felix. Um, and, and, and that was going to be the story. That was how the motivation seemed to have be- begun. But by the time you know we, we see the end of the movie, we see his machinations were a lot bigger. He wanted to get, <laughs> he wanted to have everything uh, that the the wealthy family had. Mm-hmm. But despite the beginning of his infatuation, starting with Felix and 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 feeling very sexual towards Felix, that's the one thing he never really got to make good on. And mm-hmm. that point is <laughs> driven home <laughs> by the desperate, really awful uncomfortable kind of sad scene where he literally Barry Keoghan's character (laughs) literally has sex with Felix's grave Mm -hmm. like the dirt that he was just buried in Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. No, that that scene was so interesting to watch. And it, like we were saying earlier, it was like, a oh, there's no way they're going to do. Oh, oh, they're doing it. Right. And it, yeah, <laughs> it was really sad. Like, that's the great thing about Oliver's performance uh, or Barry, you know, Barry, <laughs> Oliver, our pal Barry, about his performance throughout the whole thing is you feel bad for him even after you find out everything and how much of a manipulative sociopath murderer he is like you feel bad for him and you see that like like that moment at the grave and then um the night of the birthday party when he um sort of talks to felix for the last time and says like i just wanted you to be my friend i think that's like coming from a real place of honesty like he truly was obsessed with felix and had this like intense obsessive desire for him and wanted to be liked and loved and accepted by him and his family and have everything he had but it of course became so twisted and he wanted a lot of other things and it got all messed up but it it is so sad and so yeah that that grave scene was so like it's it's like showing like that's how desperate he was and that's truly something that he wanted and he and even then obviously like that's not it coming to fruition but it's like him <laughs> it's his, his desperate attempt to it's make those it urges still taking yeah. over and still running wild but i mm-hmm. mean when he meets him and he does the thing with the bicycle to kind of orchestrate this meet cute between them he doesn't know what his house looks like at that point he doesn't have the full plan in his mind no he doesn't know how rich he is i mean he knows he probably is pretty wealthy but like everyone else at oxford exactly like, he's not I don't think out. the whole plan is in place at that point so Certainly I, not. I do see an earnest love underneath everything yes at some point he's sort of hollowed out i think his soul is festered <laughs> through the <laughs> right. po- course of the movie where by the end if he did love him that is not the first thing you say about him. It's all the other evil things. But <laughs> right. yeah, I, and, and, and he tips his hand, right, at, yes. at mm-hmm. the end whenever he's like, I loved him, yes, but I also hated him. Uh-huh. And, it, and it makes it so twisted and complicated because mm-hmm. what, what seemed so innocent whenever we're introduced to the character, right, obviously it, it becomes perverted by the end. And, and we kind of, we kind of like catch up to where um, – where Oliver is by the end of the movie. Like, so at that point, the explanation, we don't really need it. We kind of, we kind of get it, but the, it's such a, a, a great exploration into very, very complex and complicated motives because sitting here today, still, I don't know which one he felt more the love or the hate or mm. was he just disappointed that he couldn't control Felix the way that he could control everybody else because Felix was bored of that stuff he had like mm-hmm. friend ADHD Felix who can't keep his his toys around for more than a summer is what it sounds like mm-hmm. uh from what we're what we're told throughout the film like he desperately seems to to want to beat that in some way shape or form but despite all of his efforts we see that fail and I think he sees that slipping away. I think he knows that it's going to reach failure. And that's why he ultimately decides to kill him because he doesn't know what else mm. to do. Yeah. He doesn't – he can't let him go and he doesn't <laughs> want to have failed his mission. Right. But what else do you do? Right. I, th- I think he's like painted himself into a corner. And I think he like starts out with this romanticized, idealized – vision of what he wants his relationship with Felix to be. Mm -hmm. Um, And you see those hints towards like obsessive, like romanticism and like almost gothic storytelling with not only with their like references to like, uh, you know, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron, but also like having sex with the grave and like, and the, the the gothic setting that they're in at the castle, (laughs) castle manor, large house. Yeah. Right. Like you, he has this romantic idea of what their relationship could be and it's not playing out the way he wants it to. And so like, kind of like, like when you're a kid and you're trying to like play a game and it's like not like you're playing with toys and it's like not going the way you want it to go. You get really, really frustrated. Yeah, but you, you throw keep, it across the room. You keep trying to mani- exactly like manipulate the situation and make it right. But then like, you know, your sibling is doing the wrong thing and you're like, oh, that's not what I was envisioning. So you poison mm-hmm. your sibling. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's, <laughs> that's kind of what's happening. Like yeah. it's so intoxicating because I do think he loves him for most of the movie. Mm-hmm. It's so intoxicating and all consuming that he keeps trying to push you way the realization that it isn't sustainable Mm. like if i i I don't have an opinion on this but i just thought of the question if felix had reciprocated oliver's feelings and loved him Mm. what would have happened in the movie 
Ooh. I mean, I still don't think it would have gone well. Well, he never <laughs> would have. And I think that's the point. Mm, like, I, sure. I, I think I think there was no way that that ever happened. I think Felix's sister was telling the truth when mm. when and the cousin too. They both said it at different points. Basically like you're you're this summer's toy. He's never going to talk to you again <laughs> after the fact. And Felix mm-hmm. himself said it. Yeah. He's like, yeah. "Oh yeah, my last friend got kind of weird after the summer. We don't talk anymore." <laughs> and so you see all this writing on the wall. You see this inevitability that Felix is eventually going to be cut out of his life and 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 this obsession uh isn't going to be stoked anymore right he's not mm. going to have any or, uh, um oliver isn't going to have any outlet for this uh obsession anymore because felix is going to ghost his life right and in fact he tried to do it and the only way out the only way for oliver to continue talking to felix after felix got bored of him was to fake a parent's death <laughs> yeah exactly. you know mm-hmm. <laughs> can i can i take just because we're talking about oliver and felix can i take a minute to do my faustus thing oh boy yes go for it <laughs> so yes yes there's a Faustus connection here but like i've earned this one okay because it's I two guys it. this movie is a series of twisting homoerotic dark academia power plays mm-hmm. and that's what faustus is all about well that's true <laughs> so that i think true. i've earned this one because like <laughs> And and I wrote this up just to keep the ideas tight because I know sometimes uh, this one I can get too much in my own head. But uh, we've talked about Faustus being the deal with the devil play. You've got Faustus being the old conjurer and the demon that he conjures, Mephistopheles, and they spend 24 years together. And then the the debt comes due and Faustus is dragged down to hell by Mephistopheles. And he's shocked and betrayed that the exact terms of the deal came to pass. So, of course, if this is a story that is literally at Oxford, Mm -hmm. (laughs) constantly referencing Shakespeare, playing with all these old literary classics, I think Emerald Fennell spins up all of these comparisons. And it doesn't need to be intentional, but I think she evokes a lot of these classic tropes and ideas, especially with Oliver's revelations towards the end of the movie. But I think we end up in a very different place where I can't just say, One of these characters was the Faustus character and one was the Mephistopheles. I don't think it's that simple. Okay. Because the revelation at the end is not like a reversal or where they switch roles. And we've talked about that this year, that some movies have done that. But I think there's a broader statement being made here. Because the whole story, down to every character that we spend time with, it's a very limited cast of characters here, but we really get a level of depth with all of them. Everyone's story, if you zoom out far enough, is the desire to control other people and the fear of themselves being controlled. There are constant references, like Tristan just mentioned, Oliver being, they talk about last year's one, last year's model of Oliver. (laughs) Uh, Farley mentions the factory where they make Oliver's. Mm. (laughs) There's this specter throughout the movie of the previous playthings, which positions Felix as the restless Faustus summoning up new companions and then tossing them away when he's done with them. And it makes Oliver feel like his dancing monkey who's just contracted out for the summer and then he can be discarded like Toy Story. (laughs) But when we go home with Oliver and we find out that he's completely lied about his origin story, the effect of that scene is us finding out that he sold his soul Mm, and integrity. And in that moment, he basically ruins his relationship with Felix. But the big revelation, again, zooming out a little, is that they're both bullshitters. Mm. (laughs) They're both performers Mm -hmm. and playthings. They're both using each other and they're both being used. That's the thing that seems to upset Felix, is that it's not a clean, linear relationship of him being the one with all the power Mm. and the plaything being at his mercy. He's upset whenever those 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 stakes are reversed. Because he finds out that he's being played by Ollie because Ollie lied, is that what you mean? Right, because okay. Oliver's unmasked as this like Machiavellian puppeteer. Yeah. But yeah. even that isn't the final word of the movie. Because yes, we're now introduced to this this new dynamic where Oliver is the Faustian conjurer. But also because we're seeing what he's done to get to this point, because we're seeing what he's done to these people in this family, he's also a demon. Mm, destroying lives weaponizing sins tempting and discarding human beings just like felix did 
with his previous pets. Okay, cool. The more we twist and reverse these characters, the more they feel like they're exactly the same person. (laughs) Hmm. Mm -hmm. They both have a base innocence. They both have a duplicity and a hunger and a need to control. Mm. So they both play both roles. This duality is shot through all of the characters. They're all puppets and puppeteers. They're all the Faustus character. They're all the Mephistopheles character. In the end, every character in this movie, because they're so desperate, conniving, and insular, they are all both conjurers and demons at the same time. I really, really like that, because I was noticing that this obsessive love that Oliver has for Felix is that complicated, like, especially, like, particularly gay problem of... I'm obsessed with you, but I also want to be you. Like Oliver seeks out Felix, not just because he's attracted to him and like wants to have a relationship with him. Oliver wants to be like Felix. He wants to be um, cool. He wants to be, you know, have, have all these friends. He wants to be the guy that everyone wants to hang out with. And then of course he wants to have all this wealth and this great family. Like, so he's dealing with that complicated feeling of, I want to be with you and I want to be with you. And that, you know, twists and twists and twists. And so I think that works perfectly with what you're saying here. That's a, that's a fun theory. I like it. That's one <laughs> of your that better also, ones. And that also, it's great. And it, and it leads into directly to one of the things that I was most excited about talking about. So first of all, um, with that duality and duplicity that you're talking about, they set that up wonderfully with lighting uh, and, and red and blue themes uh, mm. in, on Oliver. Uh, we see it most uh, prevalent and uh, prominently uh, whenever he gets uh, basically rejected by Felix the first time, uh, whenever Felix is like, hey, yeah, I'll text you later. Uh, and he never does, and, and then <laughs> Oliver realizes that he's out hanging out at the bar by you know with, with Farley or, or other people. Mm. Uh, so he gets really upset by that, and as he's walking away, he starts out basked in this blue light, and as he gets further and further away, you see him get drenched in red light, and that signals a character, a heavy character shift for him, because mm. that's it's it's immediately after that that we see him fake his father's death, and mm-hmm. that's what gets him back in Felix's good graces. Now that red symbology sticks with Oliver for the rest of the film, uh, and in his moments of triumph or when his plans come to fruition, you tend to see that color red signifying that the hate side of the love-hate relationship that he had with Felix won out. Mm. And if we really trace it back to where it began, we can see that the, you know, that little part at the end, whenever he says, I also hated him, Mm -hmm. that took hold way earlier in the film than I think we we would otherwise believe. Mm. So that duality thing is a great point. Oh, I love that. Talking about how he wishes he both loves and wishes he was Felix. Well, that gets into the Greek mythology references that I wanted to make. Um, <laughs> I'm so, so excited for this part. So I've, I've been waiting. I'm, I've, I'm fucking ramped up for this <laughs> all, all day. But like, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do it. I'm so excited. I, I, I love this shit. Um, <laughs> okay. So here we go. one of the central fixtures in Saltburn is this big labyrinth. Right. It doesn't really form much of the film uh, until the end. Um, they're having this big giant birthday party for Oliver, not really because they particularly like Oliver, but because he's there and it's something to do. That mm-hmm. is, it's very blasé. Um, and and so they're all having you know a crazy time. This is after Felix has figured out that you know the the, the Ollie has lied about his father's death, and so they're on the rock. They're they're, they're on on rocky terms. Felix wants nothing to do with Oliver, despite him trying. And ultimately, Oliver sees Felix sneak off with a girl, a girl, into the labyrinth. Um, And he follows them. Uh, Felix starts having sex with this girl um, in the middle of the labyrinth uh, on a minotaur statue. And now this whole time, Felix, I mean, Oliver is following Felix. Um, At this party, Oliver is wearing these antlers. Kind of a strange stylistic choice, I thought at the <laughs> moment. You know, whenever I saw it, but he looks really cool in it. He does. I um, it. But it was, I just thought it was kind of strange. And then I see him walk into this labyrinth, and I'm like, okay, all right, is he going to be like the Minotaur? 
okay, that's that's where my head's going as I see it. And then lo and behold, he gets to the clearing where Felix is having sex with this girl, and it is basically on the base of a Minotaur statue. So like, okay, <laughs> all right, all right. I mean, we're getting somewhere. And 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 so <laughs> Oliver basically interrupts Felix having sex at this point. The girl runs off, and it's just our two main characters having this this like come to Jesus moment of like you know Oliver really wants acceptance Felix is really freaked out that this kid's been lying to him and staying in his house around his family for months <laughs> um and his parents are still alive he was living a good life uh Felix thinks his kid's poor uh he thinks he has nothing and no one else so it really gets into this fantasy of like Felix likes to be the the knight in shining armor that helps up the poor and and you know even though he's just playing with them he likes to feel good about himself and lo and behold Felix is dressed as an angel in this one so mm-hmm. he's he's got this angelic aura about him as he always has mm-hmm. to Oliver throughout the film but that's really writ large here and so you see this demon minotaur figure clashing with this angel figure and it's it's soon after this that it cuts away and we we find out that felix is dead spoiler alert we know that oliver (laughs) poisons his champagne um and that's that's why he died however the real analysis comes after death okay so we see all of this (laughs) and i and i've got this like greek mythology you know stuff playing in, in, in in the back of my mind well Whenever we zoom out to see Felix's dead body once the police arrive, you see it's this great aerial shot where uh, Felix looks like this fallen angel, right? Because he's still in his costume, but he's like splayed out on the ground. And in the aerial shot, you see the shadow of the Minotaur looks like it's choking the life out of the angel. And that is exactly (laughs) what... Oliver did to him in that moment. He took his life away uh, as as the Minotaur. But it gets a little bit deeper than that because <laughs> cool. we talk about the the desire in Oliver to be Felix. Well, once this happens, he's dead. We see that uh, we we see that. So I'll, I'll back up a little bit. In Greek mythology, the the original story where Theseus the Greek hero, the demigod, slays this monstrous Minotaur figure. Well, Ollie takes things into his own hands and reverses those roles. Mm -hmm. In this case, the hero, Felix, dies at the hands of the demon, the Minotaur, the monster, Oliver. Mm. Okay, And and that point really gets uh, nailed and, 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 and hit home once we see that aerial view of the Minotaur seemingly strangling the life out of Felix, okay? Mm. So Felix has, first of all, switched. He has changed the destined outcome here. Felix was always supposed to come out victorious because he was always going to stay at Saltburn. He was going to get a new toy, but Mm. Ollie took that from him. But he didn't stop there because... (laughs) We, we see his, his plans finally come to fruition. He gets rid of the rest of the family. And at the end of the film, right, we talked about at the beginning, there was this idea that Oliver wanted to become Felix. Mm-hmm. At the end of the film, in the final, like, scene, which is a, this wonderful dance from Barry Keoghan. Oh, He's so good. Fully nude, it's nuts. We <laughs> can talk horrible. about that in, in and of itself <laughs> in just a second. But before this scene starts it opens on a couple of really wide pretty shots of salt burn which is now empty because ollie owns it all now Mm. the first shot that we see is of perseus and medusa another greek hero Mm. perseus is slaying medusa in this statue that we see in this wide angle shot oh so cool in the following scene it becomes clear that Oliver views himself as Perseus in this situation. Totally. He has taken on the role of the Greek hero, the hero mm. of the story, because this also comes right after he murders <laughs> Felix's <laughs> mother, right? Mm. So you, you get that, that comparison right after the fact as well, totally. right? So it, it, it's, it's, it's important to that moment, but also it, it, writ large, it's this greater story of 
Oliver flipping the script on what a hero is and then usurping that role for himself. Mm. So not only do we see that statue, then the following shot, we see this bouquet of red flowers in the middle of Saltburn. Remember, (laughs) we've already tied the color red to Oliver's evil turn, right? Mm. Well, we see that alone in the middle of the object of his desire, signifying that he's won, the evil has won. (laughs) And then the rest of what you see is Oliver doing this weirdly precisely choreographed dance (laughs) Uh, and he's fully nude but throughout this film you you see uh barry kyogen shirtless several times and he's like in really good shape he is and i wasn't sure why that was at first but then once you see this scene you realize that he's like the greek ideal yes he looks like all of the greek statues that you would see and him being naked really drives home this point he's just dancing around you see it seems like just a quirky thing to do but in that moment he strikes poses every every few feet too so in his mind he has become the hero and now he's dancing for the world to see right he's basking Mm. in the glory that he's achieved and that was a big thing in greek mythology too is glory I um, love this. This so, is so interesting. I didn't pick up a lot of the Greek themes until the end, but I'd be curious on a second viewing to, to look to look back at it. But you see him get to get to fulfill and achieve this role reversal and usurpation of the role of a hero. And I thought that that was the biggest thing, <laughs> like the the, <laughs> the biggest piece of inspiration that I had gotten from from. An artwork, a piece of artwork this year. And I was very excited to share that with you guys. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so amazing. cool. And I have a couple of things to validate what you're saying even further. Yeah. Um, number one, I read earlier today that the statue of the Minotaur was created and sculpted and modeled after Barry Keegan's own body. So <laughs> that is perfect. Um, number two, the dancing at the end, I pointed this out to Cam last night and I said I wasn't sure what to do with it. And now I know what to do with it. When he's going through the house in the dance scene, mm-hmm. the order that he goes through the house, the rooms, the order, is the reverse order of when Felix first shows Oliver through the house. Nice. And so it's that beautiful mirror. reversal mirroring exactly. So that's Also, fantastic. there's a blue room. Yes, there's a blue room. That's true. There's no red room, but there is a blue room. Right. Yeah. The red is his naked body. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Do you remember the Pirates of the Caribbean in the second one where all with the bootstrap bill scene where he like sinks back into the ship? Mm-hmm. He does the part of the ship, part of the crew thing. Mm. And he just kind of scallops back and he's glued onto the ship. Sure. That's kind of what I read that end sequence as because his body is not only like he's in amazing shape, but it looks so sculpted. And I agree mm-hmm. with you, Tristan, the poses he strikes feel so statuesque. I felt yeah. like it was almost him demonstrating to the house that he's worthy of being there, that yeah. he's he's mm-hmm. almost just another one of the statues. He's like showing every room in the house like I belong here now. Mm-hmm. I fit yeah. in. I'm one yeah. of you. And After, there's another pose that he makes that oh. that is also basically identical to the first time that we see Felix in Saltburn, the house. He leans on this door frame in a yes, specific way. Yes. Mm. And and we see Ollie do that exact same thing, uh-huh. here, further cementing for me that he has taken the place of Felix in this house. Love it. And people keep calling him perceptive through the whole movie but i think it's much more insidious than that oh certainly <laughs> yeah it's not just he's not just good with people he's a psychopathic manipulator right he's he's storing all of this information to weaponize and use later yeah it's evil so yeah. him knowing how felix leaned against the door hinge it's insane <laughs> him knowing the signet ring like mm. him having his body in perfect shape speaks to that same level of attentiveness sure yeah yeah mm-hmm. it's because he has to seduce 12 different kinds of people <laughs> i know yeah the, yeah i mean the the visuals in this movie are so good not only like the shots themselves beautiful and the sets obviously beautiful but like there's so many like visual symbols throughout like tristan the light that you talked about especially the red mm-hmm. light like I, i'm thinking especially of the scene um after um felix has died and they're all eating lunch and they have to close the curtains oh god <laughs> and it's like this like bright red light and that's when yes oliver gets victory over um uh, oh, the cousin. What's his name? Farley. Thank you, Farley. Um, mm-hmm. I kept wanting to say Theseus. You threw me off. <laughs> um, Oops. Like that's when he gets victory over him, and then he has to leave because of the drugs. So like the that that's really there. But I'm thinking a lot about the sister, about Valentina. Is that her name? 
no, no. Venetia. Venetia, excuse me. Sorry. Um, Come on. So, you know, his, their, their, you know, famous encounter outside on the steps <laughs> is a sexual yeah. encounter involving a lot of blood. And, and I don't know why I didn't make this connection earlier. She dies in a bathtub full of blood. Yeah, she, yes. And, she it's, and of course, there's the, and also that, that is, is the, true. that is also the infamous bathtub um, where he had a, indirect encounter with felix and so there's that funny messy complication and that's after she says like you're wearing his aftershave you're such a fucking freak like just that weird incestuous tangling is so fun you'll be happy to know i deleted a whole section of my notes arguing that she's ophelia but to to validate (laughs) tristan's point okay the red and the blue because i was going to use that almost just as an image in my faustus thing because i felt like seeing my felix and my oliver share these positions and reverse and double down it felt like like I was watching these two images come closer and closer and closer until they overlapped fully. It felt like the old school 3D with the red and the blue. Oh, yeah. Together mm. you see one mm-hmm. image. Sure. But the red being his proximity. The the first like truly screwed up things he, he does that basically ruins the chance of him having a normal relationship with Felix mm-hmm. is the scene with the sister. And you don't yeah. see the mm-hmm. whole act there it cuts to him later Mm -hmm. and what he did there like the incriminating thing is what he said to her it's not even like the sex it's Mm -hmm. how he talked to her and manipulated her sure so like what he did to to get closer to felix to like twist the knife a little bit and get further (laughs) entrenched in the family was with his words so he's the blood is all over his mouth Yes, and like then a wound, he gets the red, and then he dunks his head the into the blue water. Oh my so god! So you see him almost meditating in that moment, caught in that limbo between intimacy and distance, because he lives on this knife edge relative mm-hmm. to the family. Mm. Mm. Yeah, this movie is it's so, very strong. But so I have clever. a question for you guys because okay. I was so interested in the sexuality of the kills. Mm. of all of his one-on-ones with the family members, whether it was the mom, the sister, uh, or Felix, of course. Farley is interesting because he does have a sexual encounter with Farley. Mm -hmm. But my question, and I don't really know the answer here, but I wanted to throw it to you guys. Why does Oliver not kill Farley? I think just because he doesn't need to. Because he gets Farley to like be cut off from the family basically he dominates him without that yeah because now that i'm thinking about it i think this see what you think of this idea because he never seduces the dad he never he doesn't try to kill the dad Mm -hmm. he's sort of like as a distant almost competition figure with the mom at some point right but farley's much more on his level Mm -hmm. and when he does seduce farley it feels more natural but i think it's almost meant as a mark of disrespect (laughs) that he doesn't kill farley Hmm. Because he's like he he's not even a threat. Because he no, yeah. I think it's because he doesn't consider Farley because they are in such direct competition for being hangers on of this family. Mm. I think killing Farley would almost acknowledge that Farley's part of the family. Oh and yeah, murder and is such a sexual intimate act for Oliver that mm. I think he doesn't want to do Farley the compliment of killing him like <laughs> he would a real family member. I think that. Oh I think my that's, god, that's great. No, you're right. He yeah. doesn't kill him because he's not that important. But guess yeah. what he does give him? Hmm. He gives him a little death. <laughs> <laughs> no, he I'm serious. Do- no, 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 that's like, good. Like, yes. I, I know that, that that's funny and like I, I just mm-hmm. I just thought of that as we're talking about it, but he it, you know, in a way, he does uh-huh. kill Farley. I love that a lot. I think, Tristan, when we saw the movie the first time, it was like a there was a Q and A afterwards with uh, Emerald Fennel, not live, obviously. We would have bragged about that, but <laughs> it was pre-recorded. But it was very interesting getting her insight, and I didn't really catch it just on the first viewing because she was talking about Jacob Elordi, his role as Felix being the most difficult role in the movie. And having mm-hmm. just seen it, I was still completely overwhelmed by how amazing Barrack Yogan was. But watching yeah. it the second time, I cried like a baby like three different times mm-hmm. at at Jacob Elordi's performance, at Felix's earnestness and goodness. Like, yes, there's the manipulation underneath, but at his core, he's a much nicer character mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. Oliver is. And I, I wanted to talk about that performance a little bit because we were talking about these these ideas, these characters as roles, as something more than just characters on a page. And for me, if we're looking back on this year, I think this is 
maybe the most complete feeling work of art that I've sat through this year. But, and I think a lot of that is because of the ending. We're talking about deaths of all these characters right now. Like this movie answered my constant plea for every character to die. All I want is the Hamlet <laughs> ending in every movie. I want <laughs> annihilation of pure knockout, just devastation of the entire main cast. You like the finality, don't you? I do. The completion. But, but I think it, I think it adds something to the characters. Like it's not a coincidence for me that all of the great roles that I think of in Shakespeare, in those dramas, all of those plays end with a clean sweep of the main mm-hmm. cast. And I really think that that elevates everyone's character. Mm. In the modern age, it means you have the artistic integrity to not sequel bait. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it also gives a character like Felix such a tragic, beautiful, complete arc. Sure. To not have him just grow up and move away, but to have him just iced. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like he's left in the movie. He's gone. What, what is that... <laughs> <laughs> Why does that make the performance in the character better? Mm, well, I mean, Felix's character is so interesting because there's so much real humanity to him because he could have so easily been this archetypal, like, um, stereotype of character. Like, he could have been either privileged, rich asshole who has a ton of friends and is really popular and hot and gets every... Yeah, right. (laughs) Well, no, because Nate Jacobs is crazy. Like, not... not... But but that archetype, yes. (laughs) Sure. Like, like, and that's kind of how he's painted in the trailer, at least the two trailers that we saw. And just the way that, you know, Barry Keegan was was posed painted as this like you know awkward loser um but it's much more complex than that um so he could have been this like you know rich asshole who's really hot or he could have been this like <laughs> like this sweet innocent like just regular guy who's so privileged that he doesn't even know that people could manipulate him and he's just always gotten everything that he wanted and he's like a he's a sweet innocent guy and he is like both and neither of those things. And you and you have you have the added complication of his manipulation and the way that he plays with and discards his friends, um, and the way that he you know uh, kind of pouts like after he finds out <laughs> yes. about him yeah, about uh, yeah Venetia he's like all pouty like <laughs> like he's like thirteen years old I'm like dude you're like in college like calm down um, but you know he. And he had those moments of like genuine kindness and sweetness, like him taking um, Oliver to see his family yes. is like this yes. genuinely sweet and kind thing to do. And he's like, I'm not going to leave you. Like, I'm going to, we're doing this together. Like y- you're going to do this. Like being like that good pushy friend, not just like the deferential, mm-hmm. Oh, it's your, pr- sorry, whatever you want. Like kind of friend, but like a actual friend who pushes you. Um, and then of course that falls apart in five minutes. Um, but so I think that's what's, maybe when the director was talking about the difficulty of that role, I think that's where that comes from. But adding in his death, it mean, obviously it gives him a heroic tragedy and it, it doesn't make you forget all of the complications of who he was as a person and the bad things he did, but it enriches it. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Maybe that's something for us to chew on and come back to another time. But I, I I think this is one of the best like supporting roles I've seen this year. Mm -hmm. And I cannot imagine it without the death there. So yeah, there's, there's, there's some Shakespeare here and I I want to take a minute to do that properly because Tristan mentioned the horns before. And I love that Greek mythology reading. Yes. The antlers. Sorry. I loved, (laughs) I loved the Greek mythology meaning there, but you know me. There were Shakespeare references during this, so I had of to course. I had to chase those down. I mean, and, I chased down the romantic poetry stuff, so it's fine. And you'll remember I didn't do the Ophelia thing. I limited myself to two. That's true. The first one is Richard the Third, and they mention Richard the Third by name mm-hmm. when when he and Farley are looking up at the at the uh, portraits. There's mm-hmm. Henry the Eighth and Richard the Third's there. They mention him in this like fuck Mary kill context, and I think. Oliver becomes Richard the Third by the end of the story once he is this like evil failed schemer because he does come out on top but you see by the end of it that he's not winning every interaction which I think is why he has to start killing people because he can't mm. dominate and control them just with his words anymore and there's this scene in Richard the Third that I will never forget I think it's one of the most powerful in Shakespeare where basically Richard tries to do his normal tricks and it doesn't work. Mm. And the thing that you're supposed to take away from the scene, because it's literally the same person, he's like bamboozling. The thing you're reading from the scene is that he doesn't know. 
that the mm. trick isn't working anymore. Oh, okay. That he's lost a little bit of that awareness in that tripwire isn't firing. So when he's trying to like trick and steamroll people in the same way he always does and fails, I think that is where we pull back to Oliver and Venetia at the bathtub. Oh, okay. Because the first time he tries to dominate her with the blood and the, the whole thing outside. The second time, she completely rejects it. Mm-hmm. And she does the moth monologue, yes. which is one of the most powerful parts of the movie. It's yeah. good. And it, he should know he's beaten there. He mm. should know that this is a lost cause. Maybe go try to seduce the dad or something. <laughs> like, try something Or maybe new. just leave. <laughs> maybe, but like, this is the lost cause with Venetia. Yeah. And the fact that he then tries to kiss her. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's so bad. It's so oh. bad. That's the tell. Yeah. That's the tell. I love that. Because he yeah. doesn't know and he should. Yeah. And he, he's almost like letting us down, which is how you feel about Richard, because you're so complicit in him ruining these people's lives. And it's fun to get caught up in that like house of cards thing where it's fun, like during the heist before it goes sideways. Sure. You, know, you enjoy the first part of the bank robbery movie. Yeah. Seeing this all fall apart and like grind to a halt at the end was so uh, beautiful and dark in a Richard the Third way. But the other one I wanted to play was... Well, sorry, really quick to back up to validate your Richard the Third thing. All right. Also, when in that scene, I think it's Farley, right, who's talking about fuck, Mary kill the people yes. on the wall. Yes. Farley talks about Richard the Third and says, I think I'd fuck Richard the Third. He's so insecure, he put in the work. Like, of course, <laughs> that's who Oliver is. Yes. He, he puts in the work, and by the work, right. I mean killing people. Right. So well, Also... <laughs> Uh, well, I, I assume the next thing you're going to talk about is Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes, it is. Midsummer yeah. Night's Dream. Okay, there okay, you go. Cool. Go for it. So Midsummer Night's Dream is the the theme in the movie for Oliver's birthday party, which is why he's wearing yeah, the antlers yeah, and Jake yeah. and uh, <laughs> Felix is wearing the angel wings. And, yeah. and if you'll remember from the lore of this show, I also played Nick Bottom. That's right, you in did in my theatrical debut. <laughs> in my eighth mom grade. made me the donkey head. But this isn't about me, it's about <laughs> Oliver. Because right after they say, yeah, we'll have the big birthday party, blowout bash, and it'll be midsummer themed, then we show him in the horns, which is... Antlers. <laughs> it's a very important Ooh. distinction. It's not. It's, it's, it's a slight evocation, uh, evocation okay. of Nick Bottom. Like, okay. they don't put him in the donkey head. You see well, Farley... Farley Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like a step ahead of you. Sorry, go ahead. You see, but wait. (laughs) I'm so sorry. Y'all should have seen the look Cam just gave me. (laughs) You see Farley in like the obvious like costume and donkey head. Yeah. And you see Oliver in the the more slight, the nod towards the costume. And I think that speaks to the subtlety and control of his character. Okay. That he wouldn't be in like a full kind of cartoonish costume. But the character of Nick Bottom, is fawned over in Midsummer Night's Dream. He's 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 the object of temptation mm-hmm. for the queen <laughs> who's under the spell of a love potion. Yes. So she falls in love with the next thing she sees, and what she sees is Nick Bottom, who's been transformed into a half donkey. Mm. But notably, I think Saltburn is inverting this dynamic because Oliver is transformed into this like he's wearing he's wearing the antler horns, which. Right. I think they speak to like the inner sort of beast within him, sure. the hunger and volatility that we see explode through the kills in the final dancing scene. But we see him live that metaphor and look like a beast just after Felix's feelings for him have ended. Mm. So it's a reversal of the love potion mm. where he's transformed after the love potion stops working. That's cool. I also think to sort of like build upon, unless you need to finish that your idea there well no i just think in in the in the play after that change is undone Mm -hmm. nick bottom completely fades out of the narrative he Mm -hmm. acts in Mm. the play at the end of the play that the rude mechanicals are putting on for the rich people yeah and then he fades out of this world and he goes back on the shelf like all of the previous olivers did Mm -hmm. oh but this oliver recedes in the narrative because he's jigsaw (laughs) and he puppeteers his way back in via murder so okay. it's the costume it's again the idea of him donning this costume to play a role but never for long because he's playing so many different roles i think that's why the costume is so disposable and not a full body suit like farley's sure i really like that and i think to like sort of like uh, enrich that further i really see oliver's costume as him being a white stag he's got these yes. antlers he's yes. wearing all white and you know, not necessarily in Shakespeare, just but in like Western mythology, this white stag is this like 
thing to be desired it's the thing that we chase and like to conquer to to get it to conquer it is like this really is a really big deal and it's a a moment of victory and oliver wants so badly to be this object of desire to be to be a thing that people want and chase after but of course it doesn't work this is all we were talking so much about reversals right because when that's his birthday party he doesn't know anybody there except for like the three people in the family when they're singing happy birthday to him no one knows his name like great scene oh it's so (laughs) brutal and so he's like wanting to be he's putting on this costume of this thing that you desire and chase and it doesn't work and it falls apart and so i think that also adds to what you're saying and i think all of those interpretations of his outfit that are great i would even put a finer point on that i think the the fact that he's gone dressed as the white stag this object of desire is in stark contrast to the role of the hunter that he's taken on throughout the entire movie until now yeah because b- before now he was always this predator right he was lurking in the shadows trying to get what he wanted <laughs> preying on pretty much every other character in the film he literally staring in the window as yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh-huh. him deciding to go as the stag i think is a more of a commentary on his decision to sort of pre- present himself put himself up on a plate for felix who he wants to hunt him mm-hmm. i don't think this costume is just so that everybody else desires him. Mm. I think he's trying to make Felix desire him again because it was that innocence, that seemingly pureness of loss of his father that brought him back to Oliver in the first place. Yes. So trying to evoke that again was his last-ditch effort, I think. And when that fails, that's Mm -hmm. whenever he lashes out. He becomes not the pure white stag, but the evil bestial minotaur that yes. we ultimately see him become. Uh, mm. oh, and despite that turn, right? <laughs> despite the twists and turns inherent in those in the donning of those different disguises, he still tries to write his own script as that of the hero at the mm. outs once this is all done. So yeah, it's it's kind it of it's, it's fascinating. It is. I think that's a perfect way to wrap up. Mm. I, I, I so, I mean, like Maggie hinted at earlier, I've been so looking forward to hearing the Greek mythology <laughs> angle on this. Mm-hmm. It was, it was so rich. I'm so glad you reached out um, yeah. after you saw this movie. This was so much fun. I had like grand plans of like seeing which Rubens were hung in the room, but I was like, <laughs> I, that's, I don't think I can even dig into that. But like, th- the point is, there's so much to unpack in this movie, and I can't wait to watch it again and to think about it and talk about it more. So. Every 100%. bonus feature. Any commentary oh track. Gosh. We're going to devour this thing when it comes out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you both. And thank you for uh, you at home for listening to this yeah. very excited chat about Saltburn. Let us know what you thought of this movie. Absolutely. You can uh, tell us in the YouTube comments, in the Patreon comments, or you can email us secondbreakfastpod at gmail.com. We have episodes every single Tuesday and Friday. Our Fridays right now, we are just beginning a long 10 years journey through Game of Thrones <laughs> <laughs> chapter by chapter for the rest of our lives on Tuesdays we talk about all the other works of art in the world that like touch this us one. and if you want even more coverage from us you can support us over on Patreon $2 a month supports the show you get a brand new exclusive episode every month sometimes more if we're in a good and giving mood <laughs> and you get access to the complete year and a half long back catalog of bonus episodes that we have accrued over there for your viewing and listening pleasure mm. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back in just a few days. Toodaloo. Thanks, y'all. See ya.